Greetings and welcome back to the bench. Today is the question and answers video. In the previous video I asked people to write in and uh, ask any questions and uh, give it a go, see how this works out doing a Q&A type video. Before I get into the questions, uh, a couple things here. If you want to send me a message, do not use YouTube's internal private message system. Uh, it doesn't seem to work. I've gotten messages and I reply to them and I never hear back. I, I don't think it works properly. I've heard other people say that it doesn't work properly. If you want to send me a message, use um, uh, email me. Send it to johnaudiotech at gmail.com. I check it every once or twice a week and uh, I can get back to you that way. The type of questions I can answer would be something short. Uh, more goodies on the way for review. I'm going to do some amp builds and talk about output stages and you know make videos of other electronic related things. So stay tuned we have all that coming up. The first question doesn't come from any single individual. It comes from a lot of people. It's still a question I get quite often. I did shoot a video about this and it gets more in depth than my short answer here. So if you want to watch that video, I'll put a link in the description. You can check that out. But the question is, how do I stop the noise from my amplifier? I'm getting you know, a certain type of noise in my speakers. How do I fix that? Well, there's two basic types of noise. There's a hum or a buzz that's usually picked up from the inputs and there is a hiss sound and that could be produced in the amplifier or it can be produced from an external source now I have found a lot of these class D kits do have a little bit of background hiss some more than others but one thing you could do is to isolate the problem disconnect your input source and take a wire and just short the input out. In other words, just take a, a little jumper and connect the inputs together. Power up your amplifier and listen for any noise. Any sort of hum or buzz should be gone, but you still might get a hiss sound. If you are still getting that hiss sound, it's produced inside the amplifier. And depending on the board, there's probably not much you can do. If the amplifier has a settable gain, you want to set that gain to as low as possible. Some have a, a set of dip switches and you can set the gain lower. Not real common but I've seen some amplifier kits and boards have that. Beyond that there's not too much you can do. Um, if you want to get into board level hacking sometimes uh, adjusting the value of some surface mount resistors might take care of that. If it adjusts the gain of the amplifier, you would have to know how to, um, you know, look up the data sheet and hack the board. But, you know, just a simple answer is you're usually stuck with the hiss sound that the amplifier produces. Okay, on to the questions from individuals. First one is from, well, should I pronounce this? Auto Lem. Penin me. Now we'll run with that. Hopefully I'm at least close. Well, his question I can't really provide a specific answer to. And, you know, I'd have to ask more questions myself. It might make a good video for um, in the future. And we might look at mic preamps. I had questions about making mic preamps in the past. So, I might address that in a future video. But I included it here because I am somewhat annoyed at the audio quality of some consumer equipment. And, you know, I'm talking mainly about camcorders and digital cameras. It's pretty cool that digital still cameras started to have built-in video recording functions. And the video recording is pretty decent. But audio has always taken a back seat. You know, for example, this camera here I'm shooting with, uh, there is no control of the audio. 
you pretty much have to take what they give you. I wish they would provide more control with the audio and cameras. Uh, at least a way to turn off the auto level control which compresses the heck out of the sound. Um, some newer cameras like DSLRs, they're starting to incorporate that. I, for example, I know that Canon has their Digital Rebel series of cameras and some of those you can turn that compression off and you can also adjust the level of the sound recording up or down. So yeah, it's, uh, it's getting better, but audio quality is not the greatest. And the front end amplifiers to the microphones they use provide quite a bit of hiss to the sound, and you know, I wish that was better. So I'm not sure exactly where he's trying to go with this. Does he want to hack into the camera circuit and adjust it that way? Well, that's a whole nother ball of wax there, something I probably wouldn't get into, but if the camera has external microphone connections, that is something you can certainly deal with. The next question is from mbaker335. The question is asking about my uh, reference signal I use when testing amplifiers, how I do that. I actually made a video on that a while back, how I measure with my oscilloscope and how I made that test signal. And I'll put that down in the video description. But real quickly, I just used uh, Audacity. I created a fundamental uh, one kilohertz signal. And then I added a signal with an amplitude of 1% of that at 4.5 kilohertz. The reason for using 4.5 kilohertz for that 1% pilot signal was so that it doesn't cover up any harmonics that are generated from the circuit I'm testing. In other words, if I put that signal at uh, like 3 kilohertz or 4 kilohertz, it would be covering up one of the harmonic components. So putting it at a non-harmonically related position, which is, for example, 4.5 kilohertz, it doesn't cover that up. So yeah, check the video description and I have a video already made on that. Next up is Rimmer's Bryguri. Hopefully I got that halfway right. And he wants to know why he sees electrolytic capacitors used in audio amplifier boards like this one when they're supposed to be bad for the sound. You know, they can add distortion to the sound. Well, that's not entirely true. And if you see on this board, there are several electrolytic capacitors. These larger ones are across the supply rails. And that's really important because depending on your power supply, if there is a large demanding passage in the music that demands a lot of current from the amplifier, these capacitors will help supply that. There's also film or ceramic capacitors across the supply rails that help keep the amplifier stable. These are not really in the signal path. They're nothing to worry about. However, in some cases, you do see electrolytic capacitors used in the signal path. But it is not necessarily going to hurt the sound quality. The reason why is electrolytic capacitors do add some distortion when there's a large voltage swing across their plates. However, in a situation such as an input coupling capacitor, you design the amplifier so that the pole frequency is very low. It's acting as a high pass filter because it's blocking DC. So you set the pole frequency down to like a, you know, under five hertz. At normal audio music frequencies, there's very little voltage across the plates of the capacitor and therefore it's not going to add distortion to the sound very much at all, put it that way. You know, I would use film capacitors wherever I can. However, larger value film capacitors are going to be physically large and expensive. Next question by this person here. Is there a pin for pin compatible chip that can replace the TDA2822 that has more power? Unfortunately, I'm not aware of one. The problem with the TDA uh, 2822 IC, it's a very small chip. It's stereo, you know, two channels, it's got to drive two loudspeakers. 
it's not able to handle a lot of power because of the heat it would produce. Um, my recommendation would be to go to another chip. I'm very fond of the TDA7268 stereo amplifier IC. Uh, at 9 volts, it will handle 4 ohm loads where the 2822 cannot, and therefore you'll be able to get more power. And for a given supply voltage, it is able to output more power, so that's another plus. Unfortunately, that chip is discontinued, but you can get it on uh, places like eBay. There are some vendors that specialize in recovering chips from boards that you know it's part of a production of a product that never happened and they go in and recover chips that have certain value to them and resell them unfortunately the recovery process does take some effort and the chips are more expensive but you know if you're building a little amplifier for example you know what's a few extra bucks in you know getting a good chip to use and if you're not bound to using linear class AB type amps, you can use these little uh, boards here. This is a little stereo PAM8403 board. Uh, you are limited to up to 5 volts, but because the outputs are bridged, you get very good output power from these. And you can use them with 4 ohm loads. So, you know, that might be worth considering. Next up is Ashley Booth. Who wants to know how do I scope the output of a class D amplifier as these usually have a bridged output and because the shield side of the scope probe is ground wouldn't it short it out that's a very good question because yeah if your scope is grounded and some other part of this circuit is grounded like the uh, power supply or maybe the input is grounded it could cause a short and potentially damage the amplifier. In my case, my outputs are floating. I do have a ground terminal that I can connect the uh, outputs to. I don't use that because I want to keep my outputs from my power supply floating. And also my signal source is floating. So you have to keep all that floating if you're going to scope the output of a class D amp otherwise you can short out the channel and cause the current limit to kick in or even damage the amplifier. Stringer News 1 has a question about coupling amplifier outputs to the load. Oh listen to that. Oh we got a kitty crying. Why do we have a kitty crying? We always have these cat interruptions in my video. But anyway yeah that's a subject for another video but I will go quickly through a few things here if you take a normal audio amplifier that has a dual supply like like a push-pull output stage that has a positive volt supply voltage common ground and a negative supply voltage the outputs ground referenced so the only thing the loads gonna see is the AC on a push-pull output stage that has a single supply the outputs gonna be biased at one half the supply voltage and you don't wanna have that DC flowing in your speaker so there's a capacitor that blocks that DC and lets the AC signal travel through and that way the speaker does not see any of the DC now in the case of a bridged amplifier the outputs are not referenced to ground they're actually connected across two output stages the signal is inverted to one stage to make a larger voltage swing which translates into more power into the load and be, you know because those are not referenced to ground it doesn't matter if it's a single supply or a dual supply type amplifier so those can be directly connected to the load and he's asking about a tube amplifier output stage that has no transformer well, as you might know, a tube is a high voltage, high impedance device, and a speaker is a relatively much lower impedance device. And to match the impedance, you have to use a transformer. And high quality, high fidelity 
output transformers are expensive. They're wound on special cores. You know, the windings are interleaved in a special way to get the signal just right. Be right back. The battery's going to quit. All right. Cat has been detained in the bedroom. Fully charged battery in the camera. Fully charged icing anointment utensil. You might know what that's from if you're a fan of this particular musician. So anyway, yeah, tubes are high impedance devices and you need a high quality transformer to couple the audio signal to the speaker. But what you can do is to reduce the output impedance of a tube amplifier is to use uh, several tubes in parallel with each other, several output tubes, and it reduces the impedance. However, it would seem to me that you would need a whole bunch of tubes because the output impedance of a speaker is very, very low, you know, compared to tubes that might have uh, uh, several kilo ohms of equivalent output impedance. If there's enough headroom, they could use negative feedback to reduce the output impedance of the amplifier. For but I'm not an expert on um, that type of circuit, so I will leave it at that. David Harms writes, question, I just picked up a few LM1875, LM3886, TDA7293s to play with. And to cut to the chase, he wants to know if there are any other chips that I would recommend to try. Well, there is one more chip that I think is very good, and that is the LM3875. It's kind of the bigger brother to the LM1875. It comes in a package like the LM3886, but only five of the pins are used. So it's kind of like a five pin chip like the LM1875 was. It can handle some more power than the LM1875. It is discontinued, but you should be able to find it on the second market. Berno Inferno writes, can I have multiple amplifiers, in this case Class D, in one speaker? For example, one amplifier handles the woofer, another the mid-range, and another for the tweeter. Absolutely, this is called an active crossover. On the input of each amplifier is an active filter that passes only the frequencies that that particular driver is going to handle. It's a much better way to go than a passive crossover. Though it does require more amplifier boards, you know, if you have a three-way speaker and you're going to handle each driver with one amplifier, you'll need six total amplifiers for a stereo setup. And of course, you'll have to have a filter designed on each input. If you're going to build the speaker, of course, you have to have the driver parameters and alignment set up for the cabinet that it's going to be in and then do all the filter design to get the frequencies correct and you can have a very amazing sounding speaker doing that. Now this is a pretty in-depth project I can't explain you know all the details here but you know that's just the basics of getting going on that. But yeah I would highly recommend a active crossover setup. Last but not least is from 0x07AF sounds like a memory address. I'm not a microcomputer expert, so I'm not sure if there's any significance to that number or not. But the gist of this question is, how can I be supported? Uh, I don't have Patreon set up. I'm not sure if I'm going to use that or not. I've compared other channels that have the same subscribership and viewership as mine, and it doesn't seem like they're getting a lot of income from Patreon. So. Yeah, I'm not sure if I will use that or not. The simplest way of supporting any monetized channel is by letting the ads play through. But when you skip the ad, the channel does not benefit from that in any way. Most of all, the responsibility is on me to make videos that people would want to watch, at least entertaining or educational, and I'll get more following that way. I don't think I'm anything special or above anyone. I just I just enjoy electronics and making videos about it. Well, this wraps up the Q&A session here. Hopefully it's something interesting. We might do some more in the future. I will continue to respond to comments in the comment section every now and then. You know, sometimes I get busy and I can't do that all the time. But yeah, we'll see how this works out. And uh, 
continue on from here. Thanks for watching.